Hey, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Grand Rounds. Um, before I introduce the speaker for tonight, I just want to say that if anyone has any questions at all at any point throughout the talk tonight, just write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them at the end. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Elizabeth Komen is a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Center. She is an internationally sought after clinician and physician scientist recognized for her compassion and easy to comprehend communication with patients. She is also an assistant professor of medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Komen earned her BA in the history of science from Harvard College and her MD from Harvard Medical School. She completed her residency in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital and her fellowship in oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Komen is the recipient of numerous prestigious grants and awards, including Department of Defense Breakthrough Award for Breast Cancer, the American Society of Clinical Oncology Young Investigator Award, and multiple grants from the Breast Cancer Research Foundation and the Susan G. Komen Foundation, among others. Her research has been published in prestigious scientific journals, including Nature, Cancer Cell, Journal of Clinical Oncology, and the Journal of National Cancer Institute. In conjunction with her breast cancer research, Dr. Komen also studies aging in the immune system and its subsequent impact on cancer and other diseases. She has presented her research at the largest cancer conferences in the world, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology. For the past five years, she has been chosen as a Castle Connolly top doctor in New York. Dr. Komen has appeared on Good Morning America at the Today Show. Oh goodness, let's just get on with the talk, whatever. All right. <laughs> it's, a laundry, it's a laundry list. I just wrote it in the chat. So here's the deal. I'm an oncologist. I specialize in breast cancer. This is a super small group. So what I think would be really great is I want to be helpful to you guys. That's why I'm here. It's I don't want it to give like a want want lecture where everybody's snoozing and not really interested. So I a little bit disagree in the sense that maybe people can put in their chat in the chat who they are or what they're interested in, because I can pivot in my talk because if I'm talking to a bunch of orthopedic surgeons, you know, you're not going to care as much about like random immunotherapy, right? Um, or if there's more of an interest in reproductive endocrinology and how that relates to breast cancer, I I want this to be helpful to everybody that's listening. So I'll get going with my talk, but. I really want to motivate everybody to be an active participant. You can unmute yourself and interrupt me if you have a question, I could care less. We may be interrupted by one of my three children tonight. Um, and so just put in the chat what who you are, what you're interested in. If you don't want to, I'll just keep going with my talk. Um, but my goal is for this to be helpful, interesting, and not to put anybody to sleep. Sound good? Maybe, yes, all right. Oh, there's a Q and A already. Oh wait, hold on, love it. Yay, you're a breast, uh, breast radiologist. So you're like super ahead of the game and you can even participate um, with us in the sense that I only have one slide about screening because that's not my specialty. Um, all right, so I'm going to just put this on the side here and I'm gonna get going with my talk. All right, so these are my disclosures. I do some consulting for Pfizer and Novartis. I'm also part of SurvivorNet, which is in the largest online um, cancer media company, um, and I do some work with them. All right, so I, I assume this group knows that breast cancer is a major uh, problem in the United States. It's the number one cancer, both new cases of death, um, I'm sorry, new cancer cases, um, and then it's second to lung, lung cancer in terms of um, deaths in the United States. So there's a huge ongoing unmet need to improve outcomes for breast cancer patients. And as we know, in the Jewish community, there's a higher incidence as well. So I'm just gonna put myself in the corner over here so I can see all my slides, sorry. All right, um, so one of the most basic things to really know is that there are different types of breast cancer. So on the left, you have the anatomy of the breast. This is very basic just to talk about the ducts through which milk would travel if a woman were lactating, the lobules where milk is made. Um, and there are different types of breast cancers. And the most common type of breast cancer you can see here is invasive ductal carcinoma. DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, here it's referred to as a breast cancer type. But one of the things that I'll show here is that it's actually really a precancerous lesion and one in which if we didn't do anything about it and some percentage of women would turn into a breast cancer. But in many instances, we really don't know what that timeline is and what that would be like. Um, and so we treat it aggressively, but there's a lot more work being done. And then next in line would be invasive lobular carcinoma as well. But this invasive ductal is the most common. So here's the, the pathology of the most common type of breast cancer, which I showed was 
invasive ductal. But what I wanted to show here is just sort of the progression of how breast cancer grows and evolves. So first we have a cross section of one of those ducts that I was showing, and it should be lined by just a single layer of cells like this, and it should be hollow on the inside. And what you can see is the progression towards cancer where you have atypical uh, ductal hyperplasia, which you may see um, some, you can have an abnormal finding on a mammogram. I know we have the breast radiologist here. You do a biopsy and you can see some atypical changes. Those are not normal and may be associated with an increased risk of cancer. And then here, ductal carcinoma is when, or in situ is when the, when the cells of the duct grow abnormally as a progression of atypical hyperplasia and start to fill in the duct there. But all that invasive cancer means is that it's broken through the, uh, the basement membrane on the outside of the duct and has the capacity to travel. And that's what really makes cancer what it is. So a lot of times I'll see doctors in other fields who will say, well, I've, I've, you've cut the cancer out. Why do I need to even see a medical oncologist? The surgeon said all the margins were clear and everything was removed. The reality is if you had both your breasts filled with cancer, it would look weird. It might feel weird and it would certainly be abnormal on imaging, but what makes cancer a problem and it with associated death and bad outcomes is the fact that cancer cells in some instances have the ability to travel outside the breast if left unchecked. And that's really what drives the whole field of oncology is trying to decrease the risk of what we call micrometastatic disease. So, and here's also the crux. Uh, this is a little bit of a busy slide. If I were, I'm sorry, we're not in a room together and I would try to look each of you in your eye and tell you that this is really the, the basic biology of breast cancer. Three things, okay? So there are three different flags that we think about on the outside of cancer cells. So one is the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, those go together, and then the HER2 receptor. And then when you break that down, <clears throat> apart from invasive ductal, invasive lobular cancers, we break it down, whether they're estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, whether there's some overlap with HER2 positive, you could have breast cancers that are ERPR negative, so hormone receptor negative and HER2 positive. And then you have those that are triple negative, which is generally the more aggressive type of breast cancer that we treat almost always with chemotherapy. But that's really the bottom, that's really the basis of so much of what we do now. Um, and of course the field is changing and evolving, but historically that's how we've categorized breast cancers. So what are some of the risk factors for breast cancer that people ask about all the time? So simply being a woman and getting older is a risk factor. Um, hold on, my phone just, sorry about that. Um, family history, BRCA mutations, we know obviously that those are more common among um, Jewish women and men. But the other thing that's important to know is there are many other genes associated with an increased risk of breast cancer, things like PALB2 or CHECK2. And a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, my mom was tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2 15 years ago, and we have a strong family history, but we didn't inherit anything. Well, you may still have, and there may be a role for doing more um, comprehensive genetic testing. Uh, obviously prior breast cancer, I spoke about atypical ductal hyperplasia, prior radiation. And then some of the other things that we think about is lifetime exposure to estrogen. So if you've had an early age of having your period, something that we're seeing from an epidemiologic standpoint, girls having their period at younger ages, and also later age at menopause means that your lifetime exposure to estrogen is higher. Not having children, having children after 30 years of age, and definitely postmenopausal obesity is emerging as a, as a evolving risk factor for cancer, breast cancer. These are the, you can see the risk as it evolves over time. Um, by age 40, it's one out of 233, but I wanted to um, give special attention to this group, which is often part of my patient population where over um, 12,000 women under the age of 40 are diagnosed every year in the United States with breast cancer. So it's not insignificant. We don't have great screening for these women. If they're, they're only gonna be screened really from an imaging standpoint, if they have a family history, otherwise most women under the age of 40 without a family history are often finding these um, masses and lumps at more advanced stages by themselves because they feel something. What are some of the non-modifiable um, risk factors? So as I said, getting older, having family history, prior breast biopsy, obviously you can't control that. And then again, the, um, the exposure to estrogen. 
And these are, I was just breaking down some of the modifiable risk factors as well. One of the things I often talk about in my practice, people don't recognize that alcohol is a carcinogen. So we tend to recommend less than three glasses a week. Um, weight and not exercising are also um, of significant importance. So screening, I have one slide to this, maybe our breast radiologist can chime in, but here's just the basis, basic uh, things you need to know. So mammography is what we use traditionally and classically. There's a lot of disagreement among different medical societies about what age we should start screening for breast cancer. As an oncologist, I really align with the um, breast radiologist, the American Society of Radiology, recommending that we screen starting at age 40 for average risk, risk women. However, if there's a strong family history or there are different ways of calculating one's lifetime risk of breast cancer, that's greater than 20%, then MRIs may also be necessary to help screen for women. The problem with MRIs is that they can be overly sensitive and subject women to more uh, biopsies for potentially benign findings. But the risk benefit ratio of it is tipped in the direction of helping women who have a high family history or other risk factors that might um, necessitate using, using MRI. We also consider ultrasound for women who have dense breasts as well. So how do we treat breast cancer? So there's the anatomy that we classically think about like the tumor size and the lymph node status. There's the biology, which I alluded to earlier, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 receptor. More recently, there's a lot of discussion about genomics and how we look at the underlying genetic changes that can evolve in a cancer over time. Because ERP or HER2, we've known about that for a long time, and we need to be much more um, personalized and specific about what we understand about the biology. Um, and then there's the individual, right? That's what makes this job so special and unique. Um, what are other comorbidities that a patient might have? What are their personal preferences? Where are they in their life? Um, do they have metastatic disease and their daughter's about to get wet, uh, married and they you know, don't want to lose their hair? Or you know, there could be a million, they play the piano and they don't want neuropathy from chemotherapy. So that's really where getting to know our patients becomes this really sacred space to understand how we incorporate anatomy and biology beyond just some cookie cutter boilerplate boiler plate, boiler plate context of treatment. And that's what I mean here when I'm talking about just the biology in the context of the individual becomes so important beyond just the evidence-based medicine guidelines that we all know. So what about the bi, I hope you all are awake. My kids are falling asleep. I hope everybody's doing okay. We had one person introduce themselves. So hopefully nobody's sleeping. Um, and how do we think about treatment? So the biology, again, under drives the treatment options. So chemotherapy is classically, and I don't want to give you all this, you know, information that's not going to really sink in, but chemotherapy is classically what we do for triple negative breast cancer patients or those with lymph node involvement. And I'll get on to that in a minute. Anti-HER2 therapy. So those are drugs like Herceptin and Pertuzumab. So HER2 positive breast cancer used to be considered the most aggressive type of breast cancer, but that really changed once we discovered the HER2 receptor and also newer treatments for it. So originally Herceptin, but now there's many other treatments that we use for HER2 positive disease. As you saw earlier, one of the most common types of breast cancer is estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So we're almost always using um, hormonal therapy in that context. And we'll talk about tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitors. And then of course, for especially patients who have metastatic disease, we're looking at any underlying genetic mutations that might make them amenable to a clinical trial or another targeted therapy. And of course, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations are potentially eligible very recently for a drug called Elaparib or other PARP inhibitors, which leverage the DNA defect that's associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations to help promote cell kill and, um, and leverage the lack of DNA repair in those cells. So how do we stage breast cancer? So one of the things that we often hear in the community is, well, what's my stage? What's my stage? It's like, that's the only question that the public knows how to ask because that's historically what they've been taught to ask. The way that I break it down is, is it metastatic outside of the breast and the lymph nodes in the axilla here? Um, or, or is it contained to something in the lymph node and or the breast? Okay, that's really the basic of it. So stage one, stage two, stage three, means that it's not metastatic to a non-lymph node, like it's metastatic to the lung, the liver, the bone, something like that. Everything else is potentially curable. And even stage four disease, we think that in some patients, we may even be curing them. So stage zero is what we refer to as ductal carcinoma in situ, 
which means that was that hollow tube that is then filled in by those abnormal cells, but it hasn't broken through the basement membrane. So we still call this a breast cancer, depending on you know where you live and what academic center you subscribe to. But this is this is not invasive. It does not affect mortality. But we remove it and treat it aggressively because if left unchecked, we think that it could follow that spectrum to um, form an invasive cancer. Stage one means that it's small, usually less than two centimeters, and does not involve any lymph nodes. And stage two is we're looking at a bigger tumor and or involvement of lymph nodes in the axilla, ipsilateral axilla. Uh, and then stage three is just either a larger tumor and more involvement of the, um, of the axilla. So how do we treat breast cancer? All right, so two big categories that we think about. One is what we call local control. That's what we're doing to decrease the risk that the cancer returns or evolves in the breast where it started. And that can be surgery or radiation. Um, and then there's systemic therapy, which I alluded to earlier, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and other biological therapy. So when we think about surgical approaches, historically, um, there, for, all, for anybody who's interested in, in the history of medicine, there was the Halstead mastectomy, which was this radical mastectomy where you know, it was quite disfiguring to women. Now we do a modified version of that. Um, and there's even other surgical approaches depending on where the cancer is and what's, what's appropriate, where you can even do a nipple sparing mastectomy, which is sometimes what we do in preventative settings as well. But this is just to give you a, a kind of an anatomical look of and an illustration of what these mastectomies were like. They're, they were very disfiguring um, with, a lot of, with a lot of trauma to women. And then um, through, you know, in the early 70s, 80s, 90s, the idea was that, you know, we didn't necessarily need to do these radical mastectomies because in some instances, even when you had did a radical mastectomy, women would still have metastatic disease. So the idea was, how is that happening? And it may not be that it's sort of following on this train track that's so obvious. So Bernard Fisher was really a leader in this area, showing that tumor spread isn't necessarily done in an order, orderly fashion. It's not um, that, that the nodes are biologically important, but just because you have don't have any lymph node involvement, you could still have metastatic disease. You could still have disease that spread before, um, you know, there was ever any travel to any lymph node. Um, and so uh, let me move to the next slide. So this sort of led to the approach of, well, could we do a lumpectomy? Could we just remove the mass and in turn follow that by radiation? And what we know is that if you can do a lumpectomy, that a lumpectomy plus radiation has the same survival as a mastectomy. So I still get many doctors asking me, well, how could that possibly be? So here's the simple analogy, and I don't have a picture for it, but just roll with me. Um, if, you, if you imagine that you have a barn and you have horse that, horses that are in the barn, and you care about the horses that are in the barn, and you care about horses that could have escaped. If you imagine that the, that the breast is the barn and the horses are cancer cells, if you remove the barn and you remove the horses that are in the barn, but before you ever got involved in all of this, the horse, some horse has already escaped. It doesn't matter what you do to the barn if you're worried about metastatic disease and the horses that could have escaped. So all you do when you take away the barn is prevent you know, new horses from hanging out in there or, or, or lying around in there, but you don't do anything about the horses that could have escaped. And that's really, really important. So your local control, the goals there are very different than, than you know, control of metastatic disease. Your risk of metastatic disease, whether you've had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy plus radiation are the same. Um, this is just showing how we now do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So we used to do these, in addition to a Halstead mastectomy, very aggressive, um, I'm just checking on my time here, we're, we're doing okay, very aggressive um, axillary dissections, which could cause a lot of lymphedema and disfigure, disfigurement. Sometimes we still have to do those, but more recently we do sentinel lymph node biopsies so that we can minimize the number of lymph nodes that we remove from women. Um, and this is just what I was talking about here. So sentinel sampling, sometimes it's only one to four lymph nodes as opposed to 15 to 40 lymph nodes that we might do, which requires a surgical drain. And there may also be significantly lymphedema. Um, hold on, I have a question. Is it possible to get breast cancer when nursing? Yes. Um, 
So just just with these two questions. So yes, there I see I've seen pregnant women and certainly breast cancer when somebody's nursing. Absolutely. Um, DCIS would look like on a mammogram and ultrasound. So you're not going to see it necessarily on an ultrasound, but you could certainly see it on a mammogram. Um, and maybe our breast radiologist wants to weigh in and answer what that looks like on a mammogram um, because it can it can look different in different settings. So I'm going to move on um, and then maybe we can come back to that question. So, and then in terms of treatment approaches, I've alluded to chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and biological therapy. So when do we give... Um, chemotherapy. So in high risk disease, where we think that there's a big risk that they had micrometastatic disease, that even if you did a PET scan and CAT scan, you wouldn't necessarily see, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily see these microscopic cells because they have to form a big mass in order to be visible on any imaging. But we know that, that they, that women have a high risk for that. That's an instance where we're going to be using chemotherapy, um, aggressive biology, like triple negative, where we know we can't use hormonal therapy. Um, and then in patients who have HER2 positive disease. So HER2 positive disease, um, you always have to combine one of the antibodies like Herceptin and Pertuzumab with a backbone of chemotherapy. The other thing that's important to know, I'm just make sure we don't have any more um, questions. So Oncotype TX is a relatively newer test that we use for estrogen receptor positive disease. And it's a test that basically tells us um, in patients who have one to three positive lymph nodes or no lymph nodes involved, what's the potential benefit of chemotherapy? It tells us what's the metastatic potential of the cancer that's been removed. And might there be a role for not using chemotherapy for those patients? So when Oncotype DX was approved and more recently, there was a study called the Taylor RX study, the largest study of breast cancer patients, some of whom got um, chemotherapy and some of whom did not based on the score from an onco Oncotype um, DX. And what it found was that a vast majority of women you did not need to give chemotherapy to and could have the same excellent outcomes. So I hope everyone's doing okay. Awake. All right, you're good. I'm getting a smile. I have one face on here. That's, that's all I see, right? Everybody else? Okay, cool. All right. Um, so when do we give hormonal therapy? So we give hormonal therapy um, for estrogen receptor positive tumors. So those are classically in postmenopausal women. We think about giving aromatase inhibitors. Those decrease the production of estrogen. Sometimes we have to do tamoxifen in those women because they can't tolerate aromatase inhibitors. Some of the side effects include decreased bone density, joint aches, vaginal dryness, decrease in libido. Tamoxifen gets a bad rap in the media, but it's actually largely very well tolerated. Some women, and that's classically what we use for premenopausal women. There can be um, hot flashes. You, there's a slightly increased risk of blood clots similar to birth control pills. And there's also a very slight increased risk of uterine cancer. But this is something that particularly with premenopausal women, we talk to them about what their preferences may be. And in some instances, we're more aggressive about how we manage them from a hormonal standpoint. And we actually may ovarian suppress them um, with Lupron or Zolidex and then do an aromatase inhibitor. And that's because we think that their cancer is so driven by estrogen that we really need to drive down the production of estrogen and its ability to stimulate a cancer. Um, hold on, I'm gonna just see what questions. Um, so how do, and then I'll get, so a couple questions. So how do you choose between the different AIs? You don't really, so they all work the same. And sometimes you start one, um, you start one and someone comes in and they have some side effects and you have no idea when they switch to another one that they have, they don't have those side effects anymore. So there's, they all work the same way. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason why you choose one versus the other. But if somebody has metastatic disease, then we might be cycling through different options and different backbones of aromatase inhibitors and combining them with other um, drugs like CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, which RNA genomic tests are you talking about? Maybe we could, if you're a little bit more specific, um, when we think about things like Oncotype DX, that is a genetic test that's looking at genetic mutations that could have evolved in the cancer over time. And it gives you a score that tells you what's the metastatic potential, but it doesn't necessarily, it, it's more telling you whether there's a benefit of chemotherapy. It does give you some sense of risk of recurrence, but that's not typically what we're using it for. We're looking at the risk of recurrence with and without chemotherapy. Um, let me do the next slide. Sorry. All right. 
And then for stage uh, for metastatic, oh, there's another one in the chat too. Do you ever, do I ever recommend um, BSO for premenopausal women instead of Lupron? So it depends on the age. If this is somebody that we know that's going to be on extended uh, ovarian suppression, certainly for metastatic disease, definitely, because they don't want to be coming in every month or every three months for a Lupron shot. Um, if somebody is past having their children, but we know that they were going to continue to ovarian suppress them, then we definitely will consider um, a BSO. It's actually easier for them to go through that single surgery than it is to continually come in for, um, for Lupron shots. So what's metastatic disease? It's classically incurable, but particularly with some of these um, estrogen receptor positive tumors where they may have limited bone metastasis or HER2 positive disease, where we have so many good treatments where patients are just coming in every three weeks for an antibody, not even chemotherapy. We may be curing some of these women, but for the most part, it's not a curable disease. It's a chronic disease, one that they will likely die from. Um, and my practice is, you know, probably have 50 to 60% of my patient population, maybe 50% is metastatic. So it's a unique patient population. Um, where they are often being cycled through different therapies that they grow resistant to. And it's really a balance between you want to improve somebody's quantity of life and extend their life, but also you don't want to give them so much toxicity that um, life becomes unbearable. So we work a lot with our palliative care physicians. Um, I'm very passionate about end of life care as well and how we incorporate that um, in addition to palliative care. Um, let me keep going. All right. So now the fun stuff. So let's see, it's eight 30. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about like some of the out of the box stuff and a little bit of the future. So what makes this a moon and not just a large rock is its relationship to a planet. And I know that's like a little, like, I don't know out there, but the reason why I brought that up is to really think to really hone in on the idea that we used to focus so much on the cancer alone and isolation, even what we studied in the lab. And now increasingly we're looking at the host environment in which the cancer lives, the individual in which the cancer lives, and as much as equally so the microenvironment in which a tumor can thrive or not thrive. So um, moving to the future. So I wanna just take a step back. When I was in fellowship, my husband was a federal prosecutor and um, you know, he, he prosecuted a lot of these organized crime families. And one of the things I learned from him, and it actually influenced my thinking about cancer and a lot of the research that I do was that, you know, when you think about an organized crime family, it's not, it's not just the criminal that is, you know, robbing the bank. It's who's driving the getaway car, who's enabling all the behavior that's going on there. Who's their mother, right? So if you think about it that way and cancer that way as sort of a dysfunctional enabling criminal family or a crime, it helps you kind of understand a lot of the science that we're trying to do more recently. So what do I mean by that? People may be a little too young to, I, I never really watched the show Sopranos, but this is, this is uh, instead of bringing up some mafia family, I'm bringing up the Soprano character. So if you think about who's the bad guy in cancer, is it really just the cancer cell or is it all the scaffolding, the, the white blood cells, the, the, the lymphocytes, the red blood cells, the, the vasculature that's there, the stromal cells, what else is going on? And so that's where my husband really came in. He said, Elizabeth, you need to think about flipping the co-conspirators. That's how you really take down a criminal family. That's how you really eradicate a problem. It's not just the obvious criminal, it's everybody else that's helping to make that happen. So when you think about cancer, um, one of the areas that's really important to think about is the immune system. So just like cops, there's good cops and bad cops. And you may have a lot of patients asking you, how do I boost my immune system? And I'm going to take this thing from GMC, or I'm going to have this like broccoli that someone put in a pill and everything's going to be great. We know there's no magical cure for cancer on the internet. And we also know that there's no obvious way to boost the immune system necessarily because there's pros and cons. And some of the same immune cells that can be helpful in one instance can actually help a cancer grow in another. So a lot of the work that I do is trying to understand better, how can we flip the immune system? How can we flip the soil that a cancer lives in? So if we think about the cancer cell as the target, taking a step back, where are we in terms of research? 
So we do a lot of sequencing of the tumor at MSK. This is called um, impact sequencing, where we looked at um, all the genetic changes, tons of genetic changes, hundreds that could happen to develop a cancer. Some of the mutations that we find uh, are already targetable by existing drugs and many others are potentially targetable by clinical trials. And that's kind of been the way that we've been thinking about cancer for a long time. So we do a biopsy, we genotype it, we look at the pathway, we develop, you know, newer drugs for this, we follow how they're doing over time, we biopsy their disease in real time, and we may even be looking at circulating tumor cells, so liquid biopsies, where instead of actually just biopsying the tumor itself or a metastatic site, we're doing blood samples from patients to see, can we pick up cancer cells in the blood without having to do a more invasive biopsy. So that's classically what we've been thinking about in a lot of the area of the research. And then um, I just want to bring up the point here in case we're still learning about all this stuff. So when I talk about mutations in cancer, I'm talking about somatic mutations occurring in non-germline tissues and looking at in breast cancer, somatic mutations that are not inherited over time. And then of course there's germline mutations that we think about like BRCA1, CHECK2 and PALB2. So that was just a little pause for genetics for a second. So, and then um, just moving back to my crime scene analogy, I've now kind of turned it into one about uh, seed and soil. But if you think about like a rose seed, it's not gonna grow in Antarctica. It's gonna be able to grow in Florida with lots of sun and sunshine and, and good soil. And so what about the soil in cancer is more ripe in some patients versus others? And that's a lot of what my research is about. And at MSKM do a lot of collaborative work looking at how exercise might be helpful in modifying the soil. Um, what about diet? What about body composition? You know, We talk about BMI, but we know that that really doesn't take into account um, Sorry. Um, that really doesn't take into account uh, the fat to muscle ratio. You could be skinny fat and have the same risk of breast cancer as someone who's more overweight if you've got a relatively higher percentage of fat in your body relative to muscle. A lot of the immunotherapy trials, which I'm going to get into and we'll end with. Um, and then the analysis of the tumor microenvironment. So again, this is what I'm really interested in from a scientific standpoint, looking at how the immune system plays a role in seeding for cancers. So immunotherapy, this has been, there's been a long, long interest in this. So this is Dr. Cooley. And um, one of the things that he developed was this idea, and this was at MSK actually, that he was potentially curing patients of, um, you can see this man here with cancer on the right, um, by giving, he noticed that some of them had these high fevers and bacterial infections. And he created this concoction that he felt that he noticed that if patients had a high fever and these bacterial infections, that he was curing some cancers. Now, maybe there was something to what he was doing in terms of really revving up the immune system in a dramatic way that somehow was able to regress some of these cancers, but it really fell by the wayside for years after that um, because of the evolution of chemotherapy and radiation. And then more recently in the last decade, the concept of immunotherapy has dramatically changed the landscape of treatment for tons of cancers. Breast cancer has been a little bit more elusive. So the problem with immunotherapy in breast cancer is unlike melanoma or lung cancers where the, the molecular targets that you're looking for on a cell are a little bit more obvious, breast cancer is almost like, um, like the invisible cloak in Harry Potter where it's, it's actually not so visible to the immune system. And the problem with that is if the immune system can't recognize that the cancer is there, then any immunotherapy that you're giving is not going to it's, you're going to rev up the immune system and potentially cause some, um, a range of toxicities, which you can see there, every possible toxicity can happen from immunotherapy. But if it's not able to recognize the cancer, then that's a huge problem. So some of the work that I've been involved in is ways to have antigen presentation to the immune system of a cancer that's otherwise cold, meaning not as visible to the immune system. Some of the techniques we use is cryoablation and radiation can actually be used in combination with immunotherapy to render a cancer more immunogenic and visible to the immune system. So what are, I'll just end with, it's 837. So I'm gonna end with um, a newer concept that I don't know what, what everyone else's fields are, but I'm gonna try to give you a lay of the land of something really that's new in cancer, but also it's gonna affect 
primary care and I think cardiovascular health in the future. So this is a Chuck Close art. This is a picture by Chuck Close. He's an artist. He's uh, famous. He recently passed away, unfortunately, but this is a picture that I took back when I was still riding the subway. Um, in the second Avenue subway where from a distance it looks like him. And then if you zoom in a little bit closer, you can see it's this mosaic of tiles. And I say all of this because forever we've been looking at breast cancer underneath a microscope and you can see these breast cancer cells. And we've always known that immune cells can infiltrate a cancer. And the assumption was, well, they were just there and they look like normal cells. So they must be normal. And we focus so much on, you know, the Tony Soprano here that there was a lot less focus on what these immune cells were doing in a cancer. So some of the work that I've been involved in is to, well, is to say, well, we know that breast cancer cells can have mutations, that if we sequence these cancers, we can see genetic changes, but what would happen if we looked at the immune cells? Like, how do we know that those cells don't have mutations. Has anyone ever done that before? And the reality was it was a relatively new concept. So we know that immune cells can impact prognosis. And here's the really interesting thing that if you're going into different fields, you should know about this. So normal adults, I'm going to slow down here, develop mutant circulating immune cells in their blood. What do I mean by that? So white blood cells can acquire mutations over time just like you get wrinkles and gray hairs, there's aging in your white blood cells that's found if you do, a, I mean, you have to come to different academic centers to do this, MSK or some, you know, in Boston, but we can see mutations that are associated with leukemia in white blood cells of patients that are seemingly normal and have no evidence of leukemia when you test them, because the percentage of those white blood cells with these aberrant mutations isn't that high. But still, it's like, well, why, why do you have these weird mutations floating around in your immune system? What, what is it doing? What does that mean? And so there is this relatively new concept um, of the, let me just see the next slide here. All right, so I already said this. White blood cells is so muta with mutations associated with your can cancer, primarily leukemias. Why is this not working? And that over time, this was a seminal, um, critical paper that was in the New England Journal by Jay Swall et al. So basically this is a normal white blood cell. You expect to have that. But as you get older, you acquire more of these mutations that are associated with leukemia in your blood. And the reason why this is exceptionally important to recognize is that this concept, it's called um, clonal hematopoiesis. So I don't know if you saw in the matrix, but this guy gets repeated over and over and over again. So this is the aberrant mutant white blood cell that is potentially the bad cop and gets repeated. Oh, I don't have the good slide. Gets repeated over and over again in your blood. Why is this relevant? I'm just gonna pause here and you don't have to, you can just listen, don't look at the slide. Because this concept of what's called clonal hematopoiesis, these mutant white blood cells, which can evolve over time, depending on the percentage that you have in your blood associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, it's more of a marker for cardiovascular disease than cholesterol, blood pressure, all of them, increased risk for mortality. So just all cause mortality, not even associated with cancer, increased risk of future leukemia, even if you don't have it already, and a whole host of other things. It is this unbelievable marker for aging that, you know, sometimes we're finding in 20 year olds and 30 year olds and 40 year olds, like as if they're completely wrinkled and have gray hair in their entire bloodstream. And why would that happen? So it's something that I'm incredibly interested in. And so we, we hypothesized when all these leukemia doctors were scrambling to understand why do we have this concept of clonal hematopoiesis in patients who seemingly don't have leukemia. So we hypothesized that the immune cells in breast cancers may not be genetically normal. So I did this study um, along with some of the leukemia doctors to look at both the blood of patients with breast cancer, as well as look at their primary tumors to see what were these immune cells like. And when, if you don't assume that the immune cells are normal and you actually sequence them, you can find quite a lot. So this is my slide, just trying to demonstrate to you what clonal hematopoiesis is in your blood over time as an image. Um, and so what we found in the interest of time, I just am gonna summarize here, is that we had several women that were young and had mutations in their white blood cells 
infiltrating their cancers associated with leukemia, but they did not have leukemia, they had breast cancer. So the, the white blood cells were like the bad cops somehow. And why were 35 year olds, 37 year olds, 40 year olds? And yes, women who are older are fine, they have clonal hematopoiesis, but why would younger women have that? So we're doing a lot of modeling in the lab where we're taking mouse models that have higher levels of clonal hematopoiesis in the blood and the mice have breast cancer and trying to see, depending on the mutation, do they have worse outcomes because maybe their immune system is more deranged. So I want to leave you with just a couple more thoughts. So in terms of recent breast cancer advances that you may have seen in the news, so germline targeted therapy. So patients who have BRCA1 or BRCA mutations were um, giving those patients PARP inhibitors, as I mentioned before, that's dramatically changed how we treat breast cancer patients. One of the PARP inhibitors was just approved very recently for early stage breast cancer, patients who had a lot of lymph nodes involved, but no evidence of metastatic disease. De-escalation studies, these were the Taylor RX and RX bonder trials that used Oncotype, that genetic sequencing test of the tumor, <clears throat> sorry, for patients with no lymph nodes involved or very few lymph nodes involved. With estrogen receptor positive disease, we're learning that you could just do hormonal therapy for many, 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 many patients and de-escalate. Don't use chemotherapy. Less is more and patients still have excellent outcomes. We're learning about how to prime the immune system, both for early high-risk patients. There was an immunotherapy that was just recently approved for patients with high-risk triple negative breast cancer, high risk for recurrence. And then we are also using it for metastatic disease, particularly triple negative disease. For HER2-directed therapies, there's a whole new whole new toolkit for what we use for these types of diseases where we may even be curing women who have metastatic HER2 positive disease because they've been on therapy for so long right now, not even chemotherapy and doing really well. There's lots of reason to have hope. There's so much new research that's going on right now to really personalize therapy for patients. So where are we going? Improving survival, less chemotherapy, better quality of life, changing the soil of where a cancer lives, whether it's diet, exercise, immune system, doing genetic analysis of the cancer seeds themselves to really drill down on what are the mutations that are allowing the cancer to grow. Um, and again, looking at the immune system, as I discussed. And I'm leaving you with this one slide, just you know, the really exciting part of my field, although it can be very depressing, anxiety provoking and stressful, is there is so much being done on so many different levels, even during COVID, um, you know, research didn't end, clinical trials didn't end. I urge you in the medical field to make sure that patients are getting age appropriate screening um, because we've seen a lot of missed mammograms during COVID where patients, women are taking care of family, elderly family members and skipping their own tests. So later stage of diagnosis means poor outcomes. So please make sure that you, your loved ones are going for their routine screening. Um, but as I said, there's lots of hope and I hope to be out of a job sooner rather than later. And that's all I got for everybody here. Um, I'm happy to, let me look at the other questions if there's any more. Um, oh, there was the q and I think we covered the Q&A ones. Um, I think we ended with, can the average RNA insight provide some to help classify? No, we don't, I don't know. So at MSK, um, I, and much, we use a different genetic test. And so at academic centers, that's much more, we use something very different. Um, so DNA, so, to, so there can be DNA variants that are germline, right? That's one type of test that we're doing. Um, so it's really important if someone has a family history or they, you know, or many family or many cancers in the family or the younger diagnosis that you're looking for germline genetics. In terms of somatic mutations, those are usually, those are companies like Foundation Medicine or um, Impact at MSK or different uh, academic centers have different tests, but I'm not generally using that AMBRI. Um, okay, what are symptoms? It sounds like you're concerned about breast cancer and nursing. So if you have any concerns about that, you need to, so symptoms of breast cancer for anybody, skin changes, nip, new nipple discharge, bloody discharge, um, any lumps or bumps that are new or different, including up into the clavicle, the axilla. If you're, if you're worried about it, you need to go and see a doctor and have a clinical exam. Um, nursing can be very difficult and complicated for a self-breast exam because you could have clogged ducts, 
things are going to be engorged and it can be overwhelming and exhausting to nurse. So I would say if you're worried about it, please go see a doctor for a clinical exam. Um, when would you recommend an MRI instead of a mammogram? Do you recommend? Okay. So first I don't recommend an MRI instead of a mammogram, an MRI. And we have, we can have our radiologist answer this as well, but classically we recommend MRI, uh, mammograms. That's classic screening. Dense breasts will often add on ultrasound. Um, MRIs are recommended in addition to standard screening for someone that has a increased risk of breast cancer in the family. So if you have gone to your doctor and there's that you can look up the calculations of how we calculate lifetime risk of breast cancer. If it's a greater percent, greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, a patient is eligible for an MRI. Um, but again, it's, it's in combination with the other imaging modalities and in terms of screening. So if someone's average risk, I recommend we start at age 40 with a mammogram and potentially an ultrasound. If you have a first degree family member who is diagnosed before age 40, um, or they were diagnosed at 40, you may want to start 10 years earlier your screening than when the youngest family member was diagnosed with breast cancer. So if you have a family member that was diagnosed at 45, you're actually going to pull your screening back to 35 and likely include an MRI. Do you recommend screening for breastfeeding women over 40 or wait until they're six months out? You should, you, first of all, talk to your doctor about that, but we definitely have um, women who are, and we can ask our radiologists, but definitely at MSK, depending on the patient, we are sometimes um, having them just pump before and still doing a mammogram. Let's see if there's any, well, someone. Um, oh, our, okay. So are patients on low level immunosuppressants just as azopite more prone? We don't know. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, we're still like this whole field of clonal hematopoiesis is just exploding and we're still learning what are, what are some of the drivers of it? So we know things like radiation or um, even exposure to chemotherapy can promote clonal hematopoiesis. But in terms of some of these low level immunosuppressants, probably not, um, but we still have to look into that. Um, how long will someone have fluid debris in breast post nursing? That really depends on the patient. I mean, there are people who are years out from nursing that can still express some fluid. So as long as it's, it doesn't seem abnormal and you've been examined by a doctor, I wouldn't worry about it. Any other questions? I actually have one last question before we end yep. tonight. Um, what do you suggest for patients who have the BRCA gene as far as next steps to take? So first of all, I think that, you know, in the Jewish community, I, I think that everyone should be tested because the risk of not finding it is too high, right? We know that at least one in 40 women or, and, or other genetic mutations that we may pick up. Um, so if somebody does have a BRCA mutation, I would say it's really important that you enter you seek out advice from a high-risk screening population group. So at MSK, for example, we have the RISE, R-I-S-E, R -I -S -E, um, whole program for women who are at increased risk of breast cancer. It's one thing if you're 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, um, perhaps you still you know, are looking to be in a relationship or you know, want to have children. There's all sorts of different considerations. So sometimes for younger women, we're doing more aggressive screening. Some women may be con considering bilateral pro prophylactic mastectomies, depending on their age and where they are in their life. And also, um, you know, depending on where they're at in their life, also thinking about removing their ovaries. You can still have children, um, certainly using our, our, our experts in reproductive endocrinology to still have children of your own include um, pre-implantation genetics to eliminate um, BRCA1 and BRCA mutations if that's somebody's choice moving forward. Okay. And I see one last question in the Q&A box. If someone has a normal mammogram but breast tenderness, would that be a reason to biopsy? So no, if you've had a normal mammogram um, and you have breast tenderness, so it depends on how long that tenderness has been there. So tenderness is usually not a sign of cancer, but I wouldn't ignore it if particularly if it's in one area. So tenderness usually waxes and wanes depending on where you are in your cycle. Um, but if you have a, something that's a palpable abnormality, I would make sure you go to your doctor and have it examined and look at, um, but traditionally just breast tenderness is not a reason to do a biopsy.
Okay, thank you so much for your talk tonight. That was really perfect for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. My pleasure. And thank you to everyone else for joining us tonight and have a good night, everyone. All right, take care.